Thank you. So um, we're, we're going to spend the next uh, 30 minutes to talk about um, our use case, which is experiment tracking, hyperparameter tuning, um, and some infrastructure we have to build internally to solve some of these problems. So first off, uh, just want to give you a little overview of what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to spend the next 30 minutes just to go over high level what is experiment tracking, what is hyperparameter tuning, and um, some of the challenges when building machine learning models. Um, we'll give some examples of unsupervised, supervised machine learning, and we'll show you a demo. Um, and yeah, let's get into it. So, when you're building machine learning uh, systems, right, you're building maybe machine learning models, and you know there, there are some challenges there. Um, you might use different algorithms to solve your problem. Um, you might want to use different hyperparameters to get the best results. Um, sometimes experiments are hard to reproduce, so if you deploy something, a model, into production, um, you want to have kind of metadata of what hyperparameters were used, what um, all, all these details, what data set, maybe the git hash if, if it was stored in git, so you can kind of know exactly what code caused this problem. Um, and then, you know, when you're training models, there might be, you know, latency and performance. Like, for example, when you're doing grid search, it might be, you know, time consuming to search all these uh, different hyperparameters. Um, so, um, typical, you know, software engineering involves what, like, you write your code, you test your code, you deploy your code, you may, maybe you do some integration testing, some CI stuff, you monitor your code. Pretty simple. But then, um, but then like, uh, to be successful at software engineering and then be successful in building machine learning systems, they have different goals. For example, software engineering, your goal is to meet a functional specification. With um, machine learning, your goal is to optimize the metric, for example, accuracy of your prediction. And um, quality, quality is measured maybe in traditional software engineering in your code. And machine learning quality is measured with your code, the data, and tuning it. Um, and you're going to be regularly, uh, you're going to need regular up updated data to keep on continuously training your model. And then the process continues, you know, you're going to be constantly experimenting with maybe different libraries and different models and trying to productionize it. Um, and we'll, we'll dig into more details on what all this stuff means. So, what are hyperparameters, right? So, um, when, you, when you're creating a machine learning model, um, you'll, you'll be presented with like different ways to define your model architecture. Um, at first, you don't know what the optimal architecture is. Um, you sometimes like is finding the right hyperparameters kind of like a black magic, right? Like you don't know exactly how many um, how many clusters should you have in maybe k-means, for example, right? Um, you might have to try different uh, numbers of clusters to find the, the optimal one. We'll show you more details on, on how to do that. But um, just remember this one thing. Uh, parameters um, that which you define in your model architecture are hyperparameters, and the process of searching for the ideal model architecture is referred to as hyperparameter tuning. So, Hem is going to tell us some uh, some examples of some hyperparameters that, and give us more deeper de details. Yeah. Um, so, typically, hyperparameters are numerical in nature. So, I have just given a few of them that we commonly sort of use in a machine learning uh, model that you're trying to train. 
So one such example is um, the number of epochs, and the number of epochs actually go hand in hand with another hyperparameter, which is the learning rate. So um, when you have a machine learning model, you obviously have a huge amount of data. So this is what we call as the training data that you need to feed to your model. And with a lot of memory constraints, you cannot feed the entire um, training data set at once. So you would need to split these up into smaller um, sizes, which we call as batches. So, and what you do is you basically feed each batch one at a time to your model for it to train. So a complete, um, so when every batch is basically fed into the model at least once is what we say as one complete epoch, right? So it's basically equivalent to when the model, uh, each of the training data set is completely fed into your model is what comprises of one epoch. And the learning rates are basically um, a small value which ranges typically between zero and one. Um, we commonly use this in a deeper neural network uh, models. So these learning rates basically allow you to control um, the amount of weights that you can assign for your input data. So um, there is really no fixed learning rate. Sometimes a high learning rate can be um, really bad for your model because in the end you're trying to reduce the loss of your model as well. So you're trying to see um, where is that optimal learning rate for which you're able to reduce the loss that the model is facing, but also you're able to pass more number of epochs because obviously just having one epoch to train your data set is not enough. You need to constantly keep training your data. So increasing the epochs, but at the same time reducing um, the loss function is what we are looking at, which are considered as two important uh, hyperparameters. And then again, you have, um, in case of neural networks, we know that a neural network has a single input layer, um, and then you have a single output layer. But the intermediate layer is called what we call as the hidden layers, which comprises of different hidden units. So what happens in a neural network is we're trying to create the input signal into a form of the output signal, which is typically like a zero or a one. And what the hidden layers are doing inside is how do we sort of fine tune this signal to get that output that we want. Again, you have a bunch of um, mathematical signal functions that you apply, which we call as activation functions. So these are basically when you add weights to each data points, um, you're summing them up, you're feeding it to your hidden layer, and inside that hidden layer is where you can sort of play around with different um, activation functions that you can apply to each of them so that you can fine tune your input to the required output that you want. So these are all, again, um, user-defined parameters, which is why we call them as hyperparameters, and you sort of do a trial and error each time that you're training your model. So now that we know what exactly are hyperparameters, why do we need them, right? So we need them because they directly control uh, the behavior of your training algorithm in any machine learning uh, performance that you're trying to do. It has a huge impact on the performance um, of this model. So a good choice of hyperparameters really can make your um, algorithm stand out. So, um, so the machine learning life cycle, you're getting raw data, sometimes not clean data, you might have to clean your data, um, and then you'd run your data through some training. Um, in that training uh, box over there, that's where you'd be doing some, you know, maybe um, some, some feature engineering, maybe some hyperparameter tuning, and then you'll be deploying your, your model. Um, maybe it could be a physical file or it could be a function. Um, the process continues as you get new data, keep on training, deploying, and, and, and also you want to monitor the live system of how well and how accurate the results are um, when you're running in, in a production environment. Um, and uh, when you're deciding, you want to decide either to do unsupervised or supervised machine learning. Um, unsupervised means like um, it's unlabeled data, and supervised means that you have some labels to your data. We'll talk about some examples of um, an example of each of these um, in the ne next slide. 
So, for example, there is k-means. Um, k-means is an unsupervised machine learning technique. Um, the way k-means works is um, basically you partition your um, you, you partition n data points into k clusters. Here, uh, k is a numeric number. Um, suppose k it, uh, basically, and, and so similar data points are grouped into under one cluster. Say k is three, and you have ten data points. Um, what k means does is it it takes the features of each of these ten data points and assigns each point to either cluster one, two, or three, and the data points which are similar are grouped together in under one cluster. And Hema is going to tell us more about that. Yeah, so as Zach mentioned, here we're basically um, plugging in different values of k. So that's an example of a hyperparameter for this k-means um, model because you don't have a fixed number of clusters. So it, it really depends on how many clusters you want to sort of uh, group your randomly distributed data points. So this is where MLflow comes into the picture and we'll be talking more about MLflow after this. So MLflow is the tool that we um, sort of think is pretty useful for these hyperparameter uh, tuning aspects because you can keep track of the different values of k that you are playing around with and how that helped improve the performance of each of your models respectively. So now that we know what exactly is k-means and a little bit about um, the differences between supervised and uh, unsupervised machine learning, um, where exactly can we apply k-means, right? So uh, typically k-means is useful when your data is numeric in nature, um, when it's preferably that it should have a small number of dimensions, but of course that's not always the case and then you'll have to do further uh, dimensionality reduction. Um, and also, it's, it's, it's good when the um, data is also sort of having a continuous um, nature to it. So that's where we would um, find k-means to be a suitable use case when you are trying to group things which are similar together. So now that we know um, what exactly is k-means and sort of where it can be applied, how many of you think you would have used k-means somewhere or have an idea of where? k-means might be or, used. Or, or, or that you've used something that uses the k-means algorithm. Don't all raise your hands at one time. <laughs> okay. Uh, what what did you use that uses k-means internally? Um, well, I used it when I was in college for one of my projects. Okay. Cool. So, uh, like, um, yeah. yeah. Hema's going to give us more details on examples of systems or apps or something that you've used that rely on k-means. So I'm sure all of us would have used Uber um, or any of the other ride-sharing applications, right? So you have Uber, you have Lyft. Um, so all of these do have some kind of k-means algorithm behind it because uh, when you're booking um, for an Uber, right, you're usually paired up with some driver. And if you're booking like an Uber pool, you have other passengers in the car as well. So that's sort of how they um, use k-means to identify based on your location, what are the nearest possible um, drivers that we can al um, allocate to you to pick up. And also they use it in their back end where they do a more statistical analysis of uh, rather than just using it in real time, they actually use it for their purpose of identifying which areas or which locations had um, the most demand for um, Ubers at this particular time, what were the number of uh, customers that got in, and things like that where they have used um, k-means. Another use case is like an e-commerce or online um, shopping experience. Again, they, they do have a lot of uh, integration of some kind of k-means in them where they're trying to predict um, how they do the delivery estimation, um, allocating nearest uh, truck drivers and things like that is where k-means is used. Um, another one is, uh, is, is sort of more complicated use case of it, but um, they do when you are do a lot of research about a particular location or area, you're trying to figure out if it's safe or not. So you have these um, third party uh, websites which kind of give you a statistics about the crime rates in these localities. So they do a lot of uh, training on pre um, 
historical data over the past years and they tr sort of give you that insights into which areas are probably safe or not. And then another use case would be Netflix, right? So when you are streaming on Netflix, they have a bunch of servers. So when you're requesting for a TV show or a movie um, that you want to watch, they try to see based on your geographic location, what are the nearest available um, servers that you can probably, that they can assign to you so that you can easily get access to that uh, particular video that you want to um, watch. Um, another uh, very uh, popular algorithm is K nearest neighbor um, and K nearest neighbor is a supervised uh, machine learning technique um, with uh, CNN you have uh, some data points that you already know what class it is um, and you, you, you we, we use these to figure out the data points that that isn't associated to a particular class um, based on proximity and him is going to tell us more details on that. Oh yeah, so there is just a simple um, animation for this to sort of understand what K uh, KNN is trying to do. So you already have um, classified um, labels assigned for some of the data points. So you have like a class A and a class B, which is uh, the blue and the orange um, colored dots respectively. So when you have a new data point, which is sort of trying to identify itself to be classified in either class A or class B, it already has a set of labels assigned. So that's how it's different from an unsupervised, where there were no labels at all. So here it's trying to figure out, do I belong to class A or do I belong to class B? And uh, here again, the K is another hyperparameter that you sort of tune and you're trying to identify, um, let's say in this example, it's trying to find the nearest three neighbors. So the black dot is basically saying, okay, these are my three nearest neighbors, of which I have one which belongs to class A, I have two neighbors who belong to class B, and it also does further distance calculations to sort of figure out who am I more closer to, and then it associates itself as belonging to, I belong to probably class B. So that's an example of KNN. And a useful analogy to remember this is um, birds of a feather flock together. So again, some um, applications where KNN might have been used, um, typically it's usually in like object detection or pattern recognition kind of systems. Um, so in all of these image processing techniques where you're trying to associate like pixel um, belonging to which kind of nearest uh, pixels that it should be uh, grouped under is where like you might have KNNs. Um, you have like video streaming services like YouTube. So these um, are all statistically based where they use some kind of KNN to identify where are my nearest um, customers and what kind of playlists or videos do they have and what can we recommend based off of that. Um, we also have like um, a popular one is like gene sequence matching. So when you have a lot of pharmaceutical companies who do a lot of research on this, um, they're trying to identify the gene composition and see if they can uh, classify them into belonging to a, D a given DNA sequence so that they can do it for further research analysis aspects of it. Um, and then you also have the credit card um, application. So uh, these are which uh, credit card or bank uh, financial sectors sort of have a KNN to sort out their customers and potentially reach out to like future customers. What kind of uh, users do belonging to which category of customers that I can further reach out to um, for further analysis. So in all of these examples, um, you are doing a lot of trial and error methods where you're changing different parameters to identify the best um, performance of these uh, models. And that's exactly where um, MLflow is sort of coming into the picture. And Zach is going to talk a little bit more about that. Thank you. So uh, as, as you saw, you know, um, MLflow is, is just is also another project that does hyperparameter tuning. There's many projects that do hyperparameter tuning. I believe CATIB is another project that does hyperparameter tuning. Um, MLflow is great. It's an open source project. It, you can deploy your models, uh, save your models in different clouds. Um, and also, you, it's, it has a Python library that you can embed into your Jupyter notebook and, uh, and has many great features. Um, but uh, just to kind of give you 
bird's eye view. Um, there are three sub-projects. The sub-project that is of interest to us for experiment tracking is just the tracking uh, portion. Um, the tracking portion, we use that. It's basically a server that runs in a container, and that server can uh, basically you, you'd use the Python library to connect to that server and store metadata. And you can also hook up that server to um, maybe deploy these models into S3 or uh, other cloud storage systems to save your models and also track um, uh, the, the Git hash and all these other metadata. And you can also um, store your um, model along with the visualizations that you generated through maybe matplotlib um, along with it as part of your experiment. And, um, and it has some great features like ab ability to search for the best hyperparameters. It has a Python API. Um, I'll show an example of it in a later slide. Um, let's kind of look at um, just kind of a bird's eye view of like, let's say I want to do hyperparameter tuning. I want to do k-means, and I want to do three different, uh, I want to try three different um, hyperparameters for k. Um, I'll try k with hyperparameter 4, 5, and 6, and let's see which one returns the best results, right? I like to kind of look at it in a kind of like a high level. Each bo blue box is a container. And they're all connected to the same data set. And then you have the MLflow tracking server, which I mentioned this was one of the sub-projects that we're running in the container. Um, and we're going to be storing all these um, metadata. And, and we can also store the model if we want as well. Um, this is uh, just a code snippet. Um, of what you would need to add into your Jupyter Notebook in order to take advantage of MLflow. Um, you'd have to import the Python library. It's just a simple pip install. And then you start your run. You log your parameter. Um, and then you log your, your metrics. You can have more than one metric. You can have more than one parameter. In our case, we're just one parameter or one metric. Um, For example, uh, if you were to run this on many, many experiments, and say you have like hundreds of experiments, it's like kind of cumbersome to like look through, click, 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 and search through stuff. Um, it has a really nice Python API. Um, what this statement over here does is out of all the runs that I've done, I want you to search the experiment ID 0 and use this filter string. The filter string is right over here, metric dot. Uh, R2 um, is less than 0 0.046, right? And only return to me one result. So if there's multiple with the same criteria, just return to me one. Um, next slide. Um, this is the MLflow UI. I showed you in a previous slide, uh, you're doing everything in Python. You could do a lot of stuff with the UI as well. The UI lets you click on three different experiments and compare them. And in here, the font's not very big, but I'm going to tell you the, the K cluster is four here, it's seven here, and it's five here. And the metric that we, we've set, we're getting back a 96% um, uh, score on here. We're getting a 90, we're getting a 94. So technically, four seems to be the, the sweet spot for our hyperparameter here. So when we're deploying this, we'll, we'll make sure our k is 4. Right? Next slide. Let's say I want to do this in, all on Jupyter. If I like Jupyter a lot, I'll just import MLflow. I'll add MLflow dot and whatever library you're using. So if you're using TensorFlow, you'd use the TensorFlow package under the MLflow dot. Uh, or if you're using other libraries, they have multiple different uh, libraries that you can use. And then you do the, you just track it with the log param, log metric. Next slide. And when you're doing things like this, you want to build 
containers, re reusable containers. And OpenShift is a great platform to be able to do build, builds and have a container built for you. If I don't care about writing Docker files anymore, I can just have OpenShift go and point to my source code and it'll do a source to image. And here in the OpenShift template, I can pass in which parameter uh, the hyperparameter is and it'll go and build and run that, that job with the, the hyperparameter that I want to try. Now, when I think about this and I want to say, you know what, maybe that's not good enough. I want to do more complex stuff, right? I want to have a visual view of, of doing this. So, um, for example, let's say I want to have a workflow, like a pipeline or something. Um, this is like a GIF. It's like towards the end of the GIF, but here's the beginning of the GIF. So I have Argo here. Um, I've already built my OpenShift uh, build, and I have a container already, but I'm passing in, in the Argo workflow, I'm passing in different parameters. So when I'm running my, my job and it's tracking my experiments in MLflow, it can even track my models in MLflow, and my models um, with, with MLflow can even store my uh, exp my models in Ceph S3, which is an open source alternative to the S3 that's available by AWS. And if you're interested in looking at this stuff, um, I think it would be good to see this stuff. Uh, let me... So if you wanted to try this at home later, you could follow this gist, but I'll just like explain it so you understand why what we're doing here. So in here, in this YAML file, what I'm doing is I'm saying that these are the parameters that I'm going to be passing into this container. Here's the image that I'm building that I just built that takes in environment variables. Um, one environment variable is very important to know about is the MLflow tracking URI, you have to tell it which MLflow instance you, you've got deployed that's going to be tracking your metrics and your hyperparameters. And then I pass in, uh, I make my script as like a command line thing where I can pass in different flags. So um, in this case, I'm using the example that's provided by MLflow. You pass in two parameters and it'll have different results. So. And here, these are, this is the workflow. So for example, um, Joanna just presented earlier on Kubeflow and Kubeflow pipelines and Argo is what Kubeflow pipelines is based on. Um, basically, it lets you decide, like, I want you to try these steps and then when these steps are completed, then I want you to try these particular steps. So uh, just to tie this back, um, and once and then you can have like it do something at the end. Um, okay, so that is Argo and MLflow integration. Um, okay. Oh, yes. Um, so we're going to show you a demo because uh, slides are nice, but what's better than a demo, right? Let's see the real stuff. No recordings. Let's let's uh, yeah, let's show them the demo that we have. And we're we're gonna be demoing uh, Karan, who sits over here. He works on the um, the Ceph storage uh, yep. predictions for fa failure of drives. Oh, gosh. Um, and he's using hyperparameter tuning to do that with MLflow. And we're gonna be demonstrating his his work. All the tough questions are going to go to you now. <laughs> it's okay. All right. Uh, so maybe we'll get the font a little bit bigger. Can everybody see that? No. <laughs> Got to make it bigger. Oh, gosh. Let me try. Let me try. Okay. Uh, wait, where's my mouse? Where? Oh. Whoa. Oh, I'm doing. Okay. You can just go in the corner. Oh. All the way on the side. Yep, there. Yep. Um, 
Yes. More? More? Stop it. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm pretty sure you can see this now. Okay, let's go to the other one. Oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, automation. Yeah. No more. All right. Cool. Okay. Um, yeah, so this was what um, Karan was working on uh, as part of his intern project. Uh, so he was basically trying to do like a um, Ceph hardware drive failure prediction. So that was the um, algorithm that he was training on. And he had a few hyperparameters that he needed to um, fine tune before feeding it into his model. So um, that's the generate hyperparameter uh, Python script that he had where you just specify a bunch of your uh, hyperparameters. And once we execute that, um, it just tells you what were the total number of hyperparameters set, and it also um, generates um, a YAML file, which basically helps you to create, spawn the job based on the number of hyperparameters that you have set in the um, code. And there is um, an experiment tracking um, uh, repository also, which we have, where you can deploy the MLflow um, tracking server as well. So here what the, uh, let me just quickly. So there's a small script here, which basically you're trying to specify where exactly is my uh, hyperparameter YAML file that I've uh, just generated. And then you're um, feeding into where your training uh, data set resides currently and where the uh, training uh, Python file also exists. So these are the, um, uh, uh, parameters that you're basically passing through and what it does is it basically spawns a new job for every uh, hyperparameter that you have set. So when we run this particular script Demo, please don't fail. <laughs> So it basically starts spawning those jobs. And as you can see earlier, we saw that it said the number of hyperparameters set were 12. So it should spawn um, 12 different jobs for you. And then we can quickly open the open shift. Yep. So this is where we have our MLflow uh, server set. So these are, are running. Yeah. We can go back to right. the slides or oh, no, go back to overview. Yeah. And then click on the ML. Yeah. So this is um the ML flow server. So this is the tracking uh, UI that we were mentioning to you earlier in our slides. It this is where you basically log your parameters. So we just um, ran this, and it tells you uh, the timestamp. It gives you the username. Um, it gives you what was the source uh, code ran for this particular model. And then you have your parameters being passed. So you have some um, loss functions, uh, L2 values. These are just parameters tuned for his specific model that he was looking into. And then you also log different um, metric values as well. So, um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, um, you could technically run this and then have your Pyth have a Python script that will go and query, and based on your criteria, find you the, the best parameters and then deploy up the model that has those particular parameters. Um, uh, and yeah, you can pretty much just uh, 
just search over here you type in a particular metric let's just say um, metric um, which metric f2 yeah there's an f1 score f1 greater than what uh, this value here Yeah, oh, actually, I can do it here. Yes, right here. 0 0.98. 0 0.9. Three. Searching, I found 53 results. I found 18 results. 12 results. And so on and so forth. Now you, you have like two results that are fit this criteria and then, you know, you can dig into it more. Um, but that's just essentially the idea. But like I said, Whatever you do with the UI, you can have it in a Python script to, and automate that. Um, and yeah, um, and maybe if I want to maybe further uh, give you a little bit more of a tour here, is I can just say, hey, you know, these two look like similar stuff, but I want to kind of compare it side by side and take a look at it like that. I can do that. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, pretty much that's our presentation. Um, we did show you the demo. And uh, yeah, we're just going to give you a little brief uh, overview of what you learned. So, you've learned the difference between regular software engineering and machine learning engineering. You've learned about some hyperparameters. Um, you've learned about unsupervised machine learning, supervised machine learning, and some examples of them. You learned about how to use MLflow to do experiment tracking. You've learned how to do put, put it put it tie it all together and run it in Kubernetes on OpenShift. Thank you. And uh, if you're interested in contributing, this all this stuff is open source. Um, one of the best ways to learn is getting involved in open source communities, contributing. Um, uh, the first link that you see here is the experiment tracking um, files for deploying the stuff with templates on OpenShift. That uh, the second link is the GoLang operator for MLflow. If you're interested in contributing in either one. Um, We'd be glad to have more contributions from the community. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, also, there's just a quick announcement. Um, so there's going to be a party, DEF CON party tomorrow at 7 p.m. And you can collect your tickets for the party today um, at 4.30 at the registration. In case you can't get it today, you can also pick them up tomorrow morning at the registration desk. <laughs> oh, we didn't ask questions. Huh? We didn't ask them about questions. Oh, um, does anybody have any questions <laughs> before we... <laughs> If anybody has any questions, just come on up front, and we'll, we'll be happy to answer them. I forgot to ask them questions. <laughs>